Thank you, Steve. Uh, Michigan State University, il y a un coin de rue, un coin de physics road et road de psychologie. Et uh, au point de vue de mon métier, c'est vraiment uh, à propos parce que j'habite là. <laughs> This is a talk about sound source localization. And my expectation is that when I'm finished with this talk, you'll wonder that you can localize anything at all. <clears throat> We begin with azimuthal sound localization with uh, a source off to the listener's left. And you can see that because the source is off to the listener's left, the sound in the left ear uh, arrives before the sound in the right ear, and also the sound in the left ear is more intense. These are respectively the interaural time difference and the interaural level difference, and they are the main cues by which we localize sounds in the azimuthal plane. Uh, we can start out by measuring these cues uh, with a system consisting of 25 loudspeakers around the listener, and um, We put probe microphones in the listener's ear canals. There's a Velcro band that goes around the head and a capsule that attaches to the Velcro band. And then this probe is light and flexible, goes in the ear canal and helps us measure. Also here behind the listener are a couple of synthesis loudspeakers about those uh, more later. Uh, here's what it looks like. There's the loudspeaker array in front of the listener here. Here, this experimenter is putting probe microphones in the listener's ear canals. Uh, synthesis loudspeakers are there and there behind the listener. And this is a free field environment uh, with no reflections. <clears throat> First, the interaural time difference. We measure the interaural time difference like this, and you can see that it goes from something a little less than a millisecond or a thousand microseconds up to a positive uh, 1,000 microseconds. And that's the interaural time difference, all the way from uh, minus 90 degrees to plus 90 degrees. The interaural phase difference is what you get if you multiply that interaural time difference by the frequency. And since we have three different frequencies here, uh, we have three different curves for the interaural phase difference, and it looks pretty much like this. This is the average of five listeners with their, with their uh, responses measured uh, with those probe microphones. The question then is, which of these representations, the interaural time difference, which I'll call the ITD, or the interaural phase difference, which we'll call the IPD, which of these representations is, is more useful or best represents the uh, the sound localization. Well, it's pretty easy to uh, say how we should do that. Uh, what we'll do is just do an experiment in which the, the other Q, the interaural level difference, is set equal to zero. And uh, one does these kinds of things, and there's a difference of opinion. There's four papers, uh, which I list right here, that say that the interaural phase difference is what you ought to pay attention to. That's what the auditory system pays attention to, and that's what's important. Uh, there's a couple other papers that indicate that it's the interaural time difference that matters. On the other hand, all of these experiments are headphone experiments. And you would think that you could control things rather well with headphones experiments, but actually there's a lot of variability in the headphone experiments, especially in the interaural level difference that you get when you uh, have different headphone fittings. And that leads to a problem, especially when you go out to large interaural time differences or interaural phase differences. And so instead of using headphones, we use a different technique. We use loudspeakers together with crosstalk cancellation. Here's the idea. Imagine that we want signals XL in the listener's left ear and XR in the listener's right ear. If you send those speakers to uh, send those signals to two loudspeakers, of course you will get crosstalk, as shown here in, in red. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, the whole goal is to uh, cancel that crosstalk. Uh, 
If you want a signal XL in the listener's left ear, you send that signal to the cancellation network, which produces for you signals Y, Y A and B to be sent to the A and B loudspeakers, and that will cancel the crosstalk and give you exactly what you want in the left and right ears. In order to implement this technique, you start out by measuring the transfer functions between the A loudspeaker and the listener's left and right ears, and then the B loudspeaker and the listener's left and right ears. You end up with a, with a two by two matrix, and now you invert that matrix, and that's what you need to multiply by your signal X in order to get the signal you want, signal Y. And it's a technique that works very well, at least at the low frequencies that we're talking about. You can see an uh, average over here uh, of five listeners. You can see their, their uh, discrepancies but in the interaural level difference between real trials, where we're turning on one of those real loudspeakers out there, and the synthesized trials uh, for a couple of different frequencies. Here's the averages down here. And you can compare that with what you get uh, in a careful experiment uh, where you, you use headphones. Uh, Bob Domnitz did this uh, years ago and got a discrepancy of about 150 degrees, 1.5 dB, <laughs> 1.5 dB. And we, we find similar things uh, in experiments where we put the headphones onto a mannequin who has probe microphones or has microphones in its own ear canals. And, uh, and we see comparable uh, differences. So paradoxically, the way to in our opinion, the way to get really precise interaural differences is actually to use loudspeakers with this crosstalk cancellation technique. Okay, so if we try to set the interaural level difference equal to zero using our technique, uh, we look at the uh, listeners' responses uh, for these different frequencies, 250, 500, and 750 hertz, shown by the colors here. And we plot those data against the interaural phase difference. And if the system really is, the binaural system really pays attention to interaural phase difference, then these plots should coincide. And obviously they don't. On the other hand, if we take these same data and plot them against the interaural time difference, the plots coincide rather nicely. Consequently, we conclude that the binaural system is really an interaural time difference meter and not an interaural phase difference meter. This interaural time difference is measured in uh, starting with nuclei in the brainstem. Uh, here's the auditory nerve coming in like that. It goes to the cochlear nucleus, which is not seen here. Cochlear nucleus then projects to a nucleus called the superior olive, which is located in the pons. And the pons then projects to uh, the uh, inferior colliculus here and to other uh, higher nuclei. It's in this superior olive in the pons that the first interaction between signals from the left side and signals to the right side get together. <coughs> and the, uh, the, the Schematic diagram looks like this. There is superior olives both sides, but for us, we have a source on the left-hand side, and the sound arrives first at the left-hand side. So it's this nucleus over here on the right-hand side of the brainstem that is going to be important because there's a delay line that will delay the signal from the left ear and delay the signal from the right ear by less. It works like this. Uh, here's the delay line. Here comes the signal from the left ear where it started out. It starts propagating down the internal neural delay line, and it propagates. Pretty soon, the signal from the right ear arrives. It starts to propagate down the delay line, and pretty soon, it hits a cell with a pretty high threshold. In order to fire this cell, you need excitation from both sides. And so all it is is a simple cell with uh, innervation from both sides with a rather high threshold. And that gives you a coincidence detector and enables the system to conclude that that source of sound is on the left. The delay line plus coincidence cells 
create a kind of cross-correlator between the signals in the left and right ears. That uh, model is adequate to explain a number of the uh, interesting properties of interaural time difference. Uh, look at this plot down here. This shows the threshold for interaural time difference discrimination uh, as a function of the frequency of the tone. And what you can see is that at low frequencies, like 250 hertz, the thresholds are pretty high or not very good. You're best somewhere around 700 or 800 hertz. That's where the interaural thresholds are smallest. And then you go up to the higher frequencies and simply here at a little less than 1500 hertz, the thresholds become unmeasurable. The thresholds simply go through the roof. There's nothing that you can measure. There is essentially no input from the interaural time difference. And this, this model, uh, this, this result, we, we can explain in terms of that, that coincidence model called the Jeff Jeffress model. We can explain the, the mid-frequency and, and high-frequency results in terms of that model. All right, uh, how about the other Q, the interaural level difference? Here again is uh, the source from minus 90 degrees to plus 90 degrees. And what you notice about this is that the interaural level difference uh, depends quite a lot on the frequency. This is a frequency dependence that has been exaggerated a lot in the literature. People will say that you can't use interaural level difference at low frequencies. Well, it's, it's, it's not really true. Uh, here, for instance, at a frequency as low as 250 hertz, you can see interaural level differences as large as four decibels. And that's plenty large enough to use. It is true that this function becomes rather flat, not very easy to distinguish between, let's say, 50 degrees and 90 degrees using this interaural level difference. Nevertheless, it's definitely a usable cue at a frequency even as low as, as 250 hertz. Anyway, this is the interaural level difference, and it's a perfectly usable cue for localizing sounds. It does have this rather peculiar circumstance, and that is uh, it behaves non-monotonically. Here I show you angles from 0 to 90 degrees, and look at this interaural level difference. You can see that, uh, well, say for a frequency like 1500 hertz, it peaks at about 55 degrees, and for all the angles between 55 degrees and 90 degrees, it actually goes the wrong way. That's because, just imagine this, I mean, imagine there's a source over here at the extreme right, then your left ear is 180 degrees away. That's the other side of something that's roughly a sphere. And uh, uh, it's, it's known from optics and from acoustics that over here at the opposite side, there's a so-called bright spot. Well, putting a bright spot at the opposite side is what you need to reduce the difference between the levels between right side and left side. So this interaural level difference shrinks like mad as you uh, go to the um, higher azimuths like that. Let, let's focus on 1500 hertz and just show that it has a distinct effect. Uh, this shows uh, the uh, source azimuth on the horizontal axis and the listener's response on the vertical axis. It also shows uh, here the uh, interaural level difference. Uh, you refer there to the, the right-hand axis. So the interaural level difference is shown here, and uh, responses are shown by the red circles. Uh, if everything is working right, then the responses ought to be a 45-degree line. You ought to see a 45-degree line like this, like this dark line here. Instead, what you see uh, for four listeners out of four is that they really track the non-monotonic interaural level difference. This is 1500 hertz. Can't use the interaural time difference. That's all finished, right, by 1500 hertz. You can use the interaural level difference, but it is going to mislead you like that. Okay, so let's do something else. Let's put some amplitude modulation on that, some low frequency amplitude modulation. Well, now you have a modulated signal. Maybe you can detect the interaural 
uh, level difference between this modulated signal or use the interall time difference in this modulated signal. Maybe that'll straighten you out. It works for some listeners. And for other listeners, it doesn't. Other listeners behave just like they did with a plain old sine tone. And they show this non-monotonic effect. Okay, well now, that's one confusion. There's, uh, there's confusions with interall time difference, confusions with interall level difference. Uh, how about front-back confusions? When you think about it, if, if your head really were a complete sphere, uh, the interall differences that you'd get with a source at 30 degrees and a source at 150 degrees would be just the same. Right? You, 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 would, you would find no difference at all. This leads to so-called front-back confusions, and, and so one has to account for the fact, well, your head isn't a sphere. But from the point of view of sound waves with their pretty long wavelength, in order to see that your head is not a sphere, you have to find some details like your nose, your ears, and, and some torso reflections too. And so you need some pretty high frequency cues. Uh, maybe it's greater than six kilohertz, some people say. Maybe greater than eight kilohertz, other people say. Uh, maybe it's a notch, famous notch at eight kilohertz. Uh, so one can track that. Uh, on the other hand, using headphone techniques uh, to, uh, to simulate these interall cues and the high frequency cues uh, has a rather bad track record because it's really difficult to use headphones reproducibly to get these high frequency cues. So uh, we will, uh, oh yes, here's another thing you can do. You can rotate your head. If you rotate your head, and if you find that the uh, source is now uh, closer to your left ear, uh, then of course that's a, a cue that the source was in front. Uh, on the other hand, if it's closer to your right ear, then, and, and you get the interall level difference, say, in your right ear, then that's a cue that the source is in back. And rotating your head is a, is a good cue. So let's look, uh, first of all, at the spectral cues and try to uh, do that. Once again, we'll use our crosstalk cancellation technique. Uh, we, uh, we'll, we'll deal with the most difficult uh, situation of all. And that is where front and back mean directly in front and directly in back, not front and back off to the side. This is, this is the most, this turns out to be the, the most demanding of all the experiments that you can do. We'll put the synthesis speakers to the listeners left and right, and because we're using these high frequency cues, uh, we're, we're going to have to immobilize the listener's head. So a listener will bite down on this bar. Uh, this bite bar has a couple of microphones at the extreme ends that we can use to line up uh, the listener's head just perfectly with front and back. Uh, listener obviously has probe microphones in the, in the ear canals. There's Peter Zhang, who's the experimenter. Um, he actually ended up marrying that girl. The, 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 these experiments are very demanding on the listener. <laughs> and, uh, but you, you have to have friends to, to do these experiments. Anyway, uh, they became good friends. Um, so here, for instance, are our cues. And you can see them all the way out to 16 kilohertz. And these show uh, the spectral peaks and valleys that are available uh, as cues. Uh, and the green circles show the real source from a, a source in back, it's a back source, in the listener's right ear. And the red dots show uh, the result of the virtual source. And you can see that the red dots correspond almost exactly with the green circles. There's a few misses over there. And sometimes it happens that this inversion technique doesn't work. As you know, inverse problems are subject to failure. We test our stimuli and we find there's a few that don't work. We throw them out. We have to test them first. We've now gone to a three loudspeaker array with, um, with a, a non-square matrix to invert. And it, it's fun mathematics, and we're actually using three loudspeakers now. But that, that's a different talk, and I'm not here to give that talk. The phase differences between uh, real and virtual are shown here. 
as you can see, they're almost less than, almost always less than 10 degrees. There's a few outliers here uh, that are greater than 10 degrees, but generally it works really well. The th reason it works so well is that this, this crosstalk cancellation technique is essentially uh, self-compensating. Here, up, up here, we, we measure the signals in those probe microphones that we put in the mannequin's ears. Down here, we're measuring the signals in the microphones that are inside the mannequin's head. And what, you, what we're doing here is we're starting out with this red curve here. That's our target curve. Start out with this red curve, and we measure that with the probe microphones, and now we pull the probe microphones out in one and a half millimeter increments. And everything has changed. I mean, one and a half millimeters, we get the green curve, another one and a half millimeters, and we get the blue curve, and everything is different in the probe microphones. So how are you going to control anything? The point is that we're using those same microphone positions to do the calibration, to measure those head-related transfer functions. And then when we inverse that, we invert the problem that we have, and look what we get in the internal microphones inside the mannequin's head. We get uh, essentially compensation for all of the changes that we've made. So this, this so-called transoral synthesis that we're doing is self-compensating. It, 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 it really works very well. It's, it's hard to do, but uh, it, it can very much be, be worth it. Okay, so this is the kind of thing we do. We say, well, maybe it's the cues above 10 kilohertz that are important for sound localization. Uh, so what we'll do is simply flatten them. So we use our synthesis loudspeakers to flatten all of those cues above 10 kilohertz and see whether the listener can distinguish a source in back from a source in front. And then we can uh, flatten the low frequency cues, we can move it all around, we can flatten cues in between. And by doing lots of experiments like this, we come to these conclusions. The first conclusion is that the spectral dips are more important than the peaks. The next thing we conclude is that sharpening the spectral contrasts don't buy you anything at all. We can do that by taking our, um, our spectra and convolving them with, say, a Mexican hat function to enhance the peaks and valleys. It doesn't buy you anything at all. It seems to be the frequencies of the peaks and valleys. So long as the peaks and valleys are big enough, the frequencies for each individual, for each location in front or elevated or in back, that uh, seems to be what, what matters. And, and Blauert made that suggestion many years ago. For most listeners, there is no real necessary band. There are, if you will, adequate bands. And some listeners have adequate bands uh, here um, between uh, 2 and 6 kilohertz. Uh, some people have adequate bands that are higher. Uh, some people have both adequate bands. Uh, and, but these are, are highly individual. And th these individual strategies with the different bands that they pay attention to uh, are, persist in complicated situations where we'll do, do something like uh, put all the low frequency components in front of the listener and all the high frequency components in back of the listener and the boundary between high and low, we can move like that. We find that listeners keep on paying attention to the same bands when we, when we do experiments like that. So that's the story on spectral results for uh, front-back discrimination. The next thing I'd like to talk about is uh, localization by moving listeners, which is a rather hot topic nowadays. And, and it turns out that there's just lots and lots of things that different people do with moving listeners. Uh, some people, like, like Thurlow, uh, hardly uh, pay attention to what listeners hear or what they say they hear. All they do is, is make movies of, of people who are trying to localize sounds. Other people uh, have passive rotation, uh, like Bill Yost. Uh, other people, like your neighbor, Ewan McPherson, uh, do a stylized rotation in which the listener has instructions to move in a stylized way from one angle to another angle over a certain span of time. Doug Brungart does walking on a treadmill. Sato studies the benefits to the blind of moving. Simon Carlisle and his colleagues study the um, 
the adverse effects of rapid rotation before you try to localize some things. Other people study the after effects of rotating sounds. In our case, we're interested in the way listeners who are freely moving, free to move however they want, uh, strategize to localize better under the difficult circumstances that they encounter in a room. Because in, uh, oh yeah, yeah, here's a picture of Bill Yost's setup at Arizona State. He's one of the guys who does passive rotation. Uh, here's his chair, and the listeners sit in that chair. You can see the circle of loudspeakers that surround the listener. Uh, your chair rotates like that. And at the same time that the chair is rotating like that, you can, you can make the sound go rotating the same way or the other way uh, in, uh, around the listener, all in the horizontal plane. This is our setup. This is a, a, a variable acoustics room. It uh, has a steel frame, bits of which you can see that go all around the room. And there's 50 loudspeakers attached to this steel frame. You can see the ones in the front, some of them in back. And uh, what we're going to do is to move this sphere here around and uh, measure the interaural differences. There's, there's microphones on either side of this sphere. And we're going to move it around. Uh, there's a tape measure. And we're going to move in one inch increments uh, from side to side and, and forward and back, and measure the interall cues that the listener gets. And uh, they look like this. Here, for instance, is the interall level difference that we would measure at a frequency of 500 hertz. And what you can see is that the interall level difference is wildly varying because of standing waves in this rather reflective room. These standing waves give you interall level differences of uh, 20 decibels as you move, well, what, along the x-axis from minus 20 inches to plus 20 inches, or along the y-axis from, uh, uh, well, what, I don't know, it was zero, zero to 10 inches, right, forward and back. And then here's the uh, interall time difference. And uh, that's measured here in, in phases. And you can see the interall phase difference goes from about minus 180 degrees to 180 degrees. How are you ever going to possibly deal with the effects of standing waves when you're trying to localize something in a room? I mean, it looks almost chaotic. It's, it's actually worse than that. Actually worse than that. Let's plot the... Uh, interall level difference here as a function of the uh, x-coordinate from minus 20 inches to plus 20 inches. And then the, the different y values will displace by uh, 5 decibels as, as we uh, go up. So the different curves are displaced by 5 decibels as you go up here. And, and what you can see is that uh, there, there's some hope here. There's a sort of flat region here at about the 2-inch mark and another flat region here, let's say, at this point, at about the minus 9-inch mark or so. And so uh, this is for 250 hertz. At a frequency like that, you can use these interall level differences. Also, you can interall, use the interall time differences. The interall time differences look like this. And so where you had a flat region for the interall level difference here at 2 or at minus 9, you have a point of maximum slope in the other parameter in the interaural phase difference. The fact is, it looks as though these two interaural parameters are Hilbert transforms of one another. So where one is smooth and slowly varying, the other is maximally steep. Here, I'll show you that by overlapping those two curves that you've seen. And you, you can see how the, the, the steep regions coincide with flat regions. So it's even worse uh, from the point of view of these interall differences, even worse than, than, than haphazard or, or, or random. Right? Nevertheless, we are able to manipulate our rooms so that people actually can benefit from sampling.
this space. Here's our, here's our, our setup. Uh, any motion is allowed so long as you keep the seat of your pants on the chair. And uh, we will measure your head position. We have a head, head tracker. It consists of this uh, transmitter here and receiver that's on top of the head. And uh, then um, we also uh, use our probe microphones and measure the signals in the listener's ear canals. And uh, we can, we can th this room is now very reflective, very hard to localize. We can tune this room a little bit uh, by putting in absorptive material on our frame and uh, find that uh, a listener actually can benefit from moving in this uh, circumstance. Here, let me show you the data. Uh, again, on the horizontal axis is the real source azimuth from minus 90 degrees to 90 degrees uh, in the other direction. And the, the circles show uh, a case where the listener is allowed to move. He can move anywhere he wants. He gets to listen for about seven and a half seconds to this tone. He can move around. And uh, you can see that the blue circles are, coincide pretty well with the, the 45 degree line. On the other hand, we have comparable trials interspersed with our moving trials in which the listener is not allowed to move. We monitor him with TV cameras so that we know what he's doing, right? And uh, here we, we um, have uh, responses shown by these red triangles, and they're all over the place, right? So uh, <clears throat> this, this listener clearly uh, benefited from moving for uh, this 4,000 hertz tone. And uh, th this is true for eight out of eight listeners. I mean, everybody benefits from motion. Different listeners have different strategies, but everybody benefits uh, one, one way or another uh, from, from moving. So this is our, our data. We have uh, nine second trials. But the first second and the last uh, fraction of the trial is, is masked, so that you mask the onset and you mask the offset. In the end, the listener has about seven and a half seconds. And over this, this span of time, we measure six degrees of freedom of the listener's head, pitch, yaw, and roll, and forward and back, and left to right, up and down. We measure all those things, and we reduce uh, these uh, motion data to a uh, nose direction which I've called gaze here, and this is the nose direction. So, so in the future, we'll reduce all these six degrees of freedom to just one nose direction. And then we have these interall differences, the interall level difference, the interall time difference, and um, so we have massive amounts of data. This is, this is one trial, right? And we, we update our, our, uh, our measurements every uh, tenth of a second. Uh, I, I told you that um, one way that you can disambiguate front from back is by rotating your head. But when you're in your room, that doesn't necessarily help you. Here, here's an instance in which the listener's rotating his head to the left. Come back. And then he looks to the midline, and then he rotates his head to the left again. And as he does that, the interval level difference and the interval time difference both indicate a source further to the left. All right. and, and you can see that, it just, that every time he moves to the left, that both these cues move increasingly to favor the left ear. Well, that's, that's exactly what you expect to get for a source in back. Here, look at the, our so-called inferred azimuth function. It sort of tracks the nose angle, but uh, because the source is further off to the left, the inferred azimuth is even more off to the left. So, uh, not surprisingly, the listener's response to uh, this stimulus was the source is in back. It was actually at, at minus 157 degrees. And, and that, so, 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 so rotation can solve the front back problem, but it can also create the front back problem if you're in, in a room. So we, we, um, we, we have a, a lot of data, and we've looked at these data in a lot of different ways. And I'm going to tell you one way of looking at these data, 
that has, has proved to be quite promising. And that's our so-called inferred azimuth model. And, and here it is, okay. So imagine that at some point in time, the listener's nose is, is pointed in that direction here. But the interaural cues uh, tell the listener that the source is over here. We know about how the listener is going to use these interaural cues because we learn that from the trials in which the listener is not moving. So we have these stationary trials and we learn what kind of strategy the listener does to localize sounds in terms of uh, the interaural differences. So we know how to do that. Right? We, we can take the nose direction and, and, and calculate an inferred azimuth. Now the listener rotates his head over like this, points in the other direction, and the interaural cues uh, point to a source that is pretty close to the original one. And so basically the small variation of this inferred location under a considerable amount of rotation strongly implicates this location as, as the true source azimuth. That's our so-called inferred azimuth model. And uh, you, you can see how it works. Uh, here, uh, the listener rotates his head to the right. I guess he's, he's all the time to the right. He oscillates around, but he's always moving to the right. Uh, this is actually, uh, this is a 4,000 hertz tone, I think. Yeah, that's right. And so that, that means that the listener is, is not going to use interall time difference. He's going to use the interall level difference you take the nose direction and you add the cue that you get from the interaural level difference, add them together, and that is the uh, inferred location showed by this, this purple line here. And now uh, we have to be quantitative about that. Uh, say at this particular point in time here. At this point in time, the um, nose is actually moving quite a lot. There's a pretty steep slope there. But at the same time, the inferred angle, the inferred azimuth, is not changing very much. And so, by our calculation, the change in nose azimuth divided by the change in inferred azimuth, angle azimuth, uh, uh, leads to a pretty strong weight. And that weight, uh, as a function of time, is shown by this, by this cyan uh, picture here, down here, on, plotted on top of the in inferred angle uh, plot. And, and you can see that uh, at this particular point in time that we were looking at about the four and a half second mark, uh, <clears throat> we, ha we have this uh, rather strong weight that comes from the, 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 the strong slope in nose angle divided by the uh, change in the inferred angle. Uh, at this uh, point in time, uh, the inferred angle was about 30 degrees uh, to the listener's right. And so that's, that's a pretty strong cue for 30 degrees. Well, uh, what, what we now do is we take all these cues and we make a histogram plot out of them. Here, here it is. Here, here's this, this, this trial 7 that you've been looking at. And here's that, that strong cue uh, at about the 30 degree uh, azimuth, uh, infer, for inferred angle az, uh, azimuth. And you can see it's pr pretty strong. And there's, there's some, some strong histograms right around it as well. And the listener's response on that particular trial was 36 degrees. And so uh, this, is, this is a trial that uh, argues in favor of this inferred angle hypothesis uh, in that the listener's response was pretty close to where uh, the inferred angle uh, weight is, is pretty strong. There's, there's other instances, like trial two down here, where, there, where there's just not much information. And our, our hypothesis really can't make much of a prediction out of this. Uh, the listener has good response, but, but who knows, right? Because you, you're really not getting very strong cues. And, and there's other instances, too, where you have uh, a response that's pretty close to uh, strong cues. Uh, I'll take you through uh, the rest of the trials of this block, uh, 4,000 hertz block with this listener, and you can see what it looks like. You can track, see how the blue dot corresponds or doesn't correspond to the strong weights in the histogram. Uh, here's an instance uh, down here, uh, this trial, trial three, where there, there is no response. That's because the, the um, response was in back. <laughs> 
And actually, most of the cues shown by this hatched region here, most of the cues were in back two. So, uh, so we just don't count that trial. We don't know how to deal with, with that. So we, it, it just doesn't count. Um, so we'll carry on with this. And you can note the correspondence between the tall histogram bars and the listener's response, which is the blue dot. And, and overall, when the histogram bars are pretty strong, they, they seem to give a pretty good cue as to where the source is. Uh, at least uh, it gets it pretty much right. It looks like uh, a rather promising, uh, a pro rather promising model, and we are going to explore that model in some detail. Okay, I've come to the point where I summarize. I talked about the major interaural cues, the interaural time difference for tones, and I've shown how it's very frequency limited, limited to about 1500 hertz. Talked about the interaural level difference and how it's a non monotonic function. Talked about how we do our experiments with probe microphones and ear canals using transaural synthesis or crosstalk cancellation. Uh, we talked about the uh, interaural time differences, the effective localization cue. Actually, I didn't tell you about that. Um, that that's, that's in the appendix. <coughs> We talked about the individual tendencies in front-back uh, discrimination and uh, about how motion in a room can uh, solve or create uh, front-back confusions and how listeners can acquire information as they move uh, around an environment, uh, getting the different interaural cues, and uh, this inferred azimuth uh, hypothesis is, is very promising. What I haven't talked to you about is a very important effect called the precedence effect, which basically says that the first arriving sound is going to be dominant in your localization of the sound. And that's very important, especially for localizing sounds in the room. But as I mentioned before, that's another talk. Thank you.